don't think you know anything about Harry Styles. In our communities. Don't talk about it again. So, so y'all, I told y'all so. Our culture. I am a Sam Smith. I will be Sam's Same. representative. Our story. It's also not a requirement for you to agree. Our opinions. This, this is, is the culture report. Welcome to this week's Culture Report. Over the past six months, we've discussed all kinds of stories. Yeah, everything from LGBTQ plus issues to gun laws and body image. And we've had some great people join us in studio and share their voices. So this week, we're reflecting on some of our favorite conversations so far. One thing about today's youth is many aren't afraid to use their voices. That certainly holds true for a group of young women in Colorado. So we had a chance to sit down with them and learn all about an initiative that they developed in order to share their point, points of view and educate their peers and some adults too. No justice, no peace, an unrestricted revolution. I know especially as a student, sometimes it could be very hard to use your voice. Not a lot of students' voices are being recognized or being really appreciated or prioritized within either the district, within their schools, or just adults in general. Even though you're an adult and you have wisdom and you have things to bring to the table, so do we. When you're young, you have that passion, you have fire, you want to do something. And a lot of times with the society we live in, it dies down as you get older. Every single generation sees things differently and they're going through different experiences and our generation like what is going on right now we have a lot of like just chaos and disorder. No Justice No Peace as a brand started a little bit over three years ago while we were after we took a trip to Washington DC. It was 17 students but after that I swear we became like a family and just being able to see representation of myself within that museum learning that there's more to just African Americans than slavery. There's so much beyond that and how we used to be kings, queens, how we were powerful leaders and so forth. That is something that I really wanted other students to know. I was not not gonna let up like on the dream of bringing these feelings back to our community and over the summer over you know events during 20 during 2020 when George Floyd had passed away we um, had a lot of students that were trying to go to the protests and my dad was not going for any of that like they barely would let me go to Walgreens during COVID so we came up with another way we could use our voice and that led to the podcast not everybody is really fit to do this work because it can't be about clout or wanting to have your face and your name out there. You need to be trying to carry on the legacy that our ancestors put out there for us. How do you feel about seeing youth use this medium like to raise awareness about modern day issues and things like that? Encouraged, mm -hmm. um, very encouraged. Um, we have, um, we've seen the evolution of media in general. We've seen the evolution of how people are using their platforms. And what we're seeing are young people who are deciding that not only is their voice important, but it must be amplified and they're willing to put in the work themselves. I'm looking over here at my girl Shay J, who um, <laughs> does the work in our community. Yes, we yes. lean on her heavily um, to be a thought leader and amplifier. And this is where it starts. You know, when I first started in media, really my story started when I was 12 years old mm -hmm. and I was making my own shows in my bedroom at home. <laughs> so there is an end game to this. And I think that watching them, I, it makes me so excited because it feels like wow, this is going to be the future of this of this movement. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and I love it. And when you mentioned Shay, I know you're, like you said, very involved in the community. I saw that Bo helped these girls, you know, offering them the space. Absolutely. After they cut ties with DPS, they lost that space to yeah. be able to record their podcast, their podcast. But us as community members, like what can we do to actually encourage more youth voices and promote yeah. it? Excellent question. I think it, it goes to what Erica said. It's about actually having a space, right? Like Erica, when I was young, I was already having this whole conversation with my teddy bears, right? And nobody else was listening. But we have to create spaces for young people to actually be able to use their voices. Whether it's community events, whether it's um, networks saying, hey, we have a space for you to talk about your perspective. We have to start making these spaces aware that youth voices matter. Absolutely. And Erica, I mean, you have a NAACP Image Award nominated Woo! podcast, so we love that. So what was the process for you growing up to develop your voice? 
Well, I mean, I think there was a lot. First of all, I am I'm very fortunate to have had a network in the form of my parents mm -hmm. who um, really instilled in me that I could do whatever it is that I believed I could do or wanted to be. And um, the other thing is I talk about this on my podcast with my sister. Um, I'm doing bonus episodes called Comeback Conversations with my sister. Mm -hmm. And we're really talking about like, who knows us better than we know each other. Right. And one of the things that she says is like, oh no, I remember being seven years old and like sitting in your room because you had me be a guest on your radio show. <laughs> <laughs> like with the hangers and all of that. So I think from, from that, knowing that I, one, like had a passion right. for speaking to people, for connecting with oh. people, for emoting. And then I found my purpose when other people started to connect and emote with me. And that's a very powerful connection. It's something that I do not take for granted mm -hmm. um, to have a following and people who really believe in not only you, but your message and want to see that amplified mm -hmm. and elevated. It's just something very special. In recent weeks, an old conversation surrounding black creatives on social media has been thrust back into the spotlight. Are black content creators being denied opportunities for growth and struggling to gain the same traction as their white counterparts? I called up a good friend to get her point of view. I try not to think about it, but social media has changed so much to where it is about the views. It is about, you know, how many likes you have. And like I said, I don't compare, but I do see that often there isn't a lot of support for black creators on social media. Jamila Parker is an artist and content creator from Dallas, Texas. She's amassed over 100,000 followers across platforms, along with over 1 million likes, from posting content just like this. She says she's been creating art since she was a kid. It's really a natural thing to me, um, whether it was drawing or painting on shoes to graphic design. It's just something that I've always been interested in. But this success she's found online didn't happen overnight. I was very stagnant at first. It's a, it's a journey, especially if you're starting from scratch. You don't know what you're doing. The apps are always changing. Probably in the last three years is, and especially the last two with the pandemic because everyone was on social media, right? And so I feel like the traction, a lot of good traction came from that time span. And her following continues to grow little by little, but the same can't be said for other creators who look like her. I don't compare myself to other artists, no matter what color they are. I feel like I'm in my own lane. I do and create things that speak to my soul. However, I have seen a difference in maybe people of color not getting the same views or the same attention as someone else that isn't of color. But who's to blame? The content creators? How about the audience? Or maybe a suspectedly racist algorithm? I don't know. Maybe it's a target audience. Maybe they just have more support within their culture than, you know, people of color do. I don't know. I feel like a lot of these social platforms, they know, they push out what they want to push out. They'll push out to the people what they want to. And like I said, a lot of it isn't in support of black people and I and I'm not going to just blame it on the algorithm but I personally when I'm scrolling I don't see a lot of me who knows why you know who knows why it's, it's not because we're not making quality art you know people of color are very talented myself included so it's not because of the art all right so like as she said she doesn't compare herself, but she sees that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Like she notices the difference that like black people have or just people of color in general on the apps. So, I mean, Alexia is our resident TikToker. So <laughs> Alexia, have you been seeing this conversation on the app? Yeah, I've seen it a lot. So I've seen a lot of different things. So I've seen that black creators aren't supporting black creators, but also I've seen, you know, black creators support each other and try to boost each other up on the on their feeds and stuff like that. So I think it's just like, what is the agri I can't even speak. <laughs> <laughs> algorithm actually pushing out? So, you know, there's an article on like Forbes, I believe, six former and current TikTok workers saying that they can push out whatever they want to push out. So what is, why isn't the, you know, black creators being pushed out on to the platform? That's funny, because I don't, I feel like what I see within the black community, when we see somebody doing something, like a black person doing something, like we're rooting for them 100%. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, 
if people say they've been seeing that, then okay. But from my experience, I feel like we go even harder. Like even if we don't know the person, we're like, oh yeah, I love that brand. They're great. Just because they're black, because we want to like get more black faces out there, more black businesses out there. So I haven't seen that. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that either. I usually I try to stay off social media a little bit, but when I do, I do see like black content creators supporting each other mm -hmm. in a way that I haven't seen in previous years. I, yeah. yeah, no, I saw a study, um, it's the MSL study, and it was cited by NPR, but they had a couple things that were interesting. So they say the pay gap between black and white is 35%. Like influencers? And they, yeah, influencers. Oh. And then um, they also said that 59% felt negatively impacted if they had like... Um, any conversations about systemic justice. Mm. So I don't know if like what they speak about can impact like, you know, followers or not, but um, I, I don't know, it's, it's very interesting if that's, that's a, a factor right. in it. I think so, because I feel like when other people speak out, in this case white people or larger creators speak out, it creates a conversation and it kind of pressures like corporations to like go with the flow, like we've seen it over the past couple of years, all of a sudden everybody cares about black people. but. It's like that, so one, I feel like you're right, so more transparency about, like maybe they can't discuss how much they're getting paid, but they can discuss like, oh, like these are how many offers that I'm getting, or these are how many, like these are my analytics for like all the videos I'm just showing, just so everyone can see how, you know, disproportionate it is. And I wanna know from you guys, do you think the algorithm is racist? Are you blaming the al algorithm? Well, like Alexia said, if, if TikTok and those social media platforms have the ability to push who trends or goes viral, then I would say yes, because why aren't we seeing an equal balance of black creators being just successful and going viral as we are with white creators? If anything, the users are the real influencers because the users influence the algorithm and they like, you know, determine what's get, what gets pushed out ideally. But like you said, there are people on the back end of that who can just pick and choose whoever they want to. But I think they're doing that because they see, oh, well, if skinny and white sells, then of course I'm going to continue to exactly. pick skinny and white. So I feel like just if everyone wants to see change as bad as they are preaching that they want to see change, then they'll start following, they'll start actively following, like, people of color. People of color. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. So Jamila uses her talent and platform to put black faces in the spotlight. I asked her why and how she feels about how she wants people to feel when they see her art. We're beautiful, fearless, strong black women. And I want people to feel that in my paintings. When they look at my paintings, I want them to be like, oh, wow, this is that's me that she's painting me. I want people to resonate with my artwork. And so I do it for myself, but also representing all the other black women, black people, black culture. And so that's a good feeling to put out into the world. So I, I'm going to keep creating and keep sharing it with people. So as we close out Women's History Month, we want to put a spotlight on a local organization here in Colorado that is, make, that is making sure young girls grow up loving their natural hair. Here with us today is Annalise Goree. She is a founder of Curls on Our Block, a Colorado nonprofit that uses science and self-acceptance to help young girls love their curly hair. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> so happy to have you. So I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, Curls on Our Block and you. So how did this all come up? come about? Well, Curls on the Block started ooh, about five, six years ago now. And so I was a special education teacher in uh, Denver Public Schools. And I was on the front lines watching young girls really struggling to feel accepted in the school environment. So what are y'all doing exactly? So somebody comes in, what do y'all have going on in there? You know, that's a great question. It depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, at, at the core, the mission is to um, uh, encourage young girls to embrace, explore, and empower their natural selves using beauty to connect with STEAM. And as an educator, I'm trying to make sure that girls are prepared after uh, they leave the academic environment for a career. And so that's the connection with steam when they figure out the right uh, chemicals to make their hair look how they want you're a chemist you're a biologist a little bit yeah ex ex look yeah so um, one of the one of the most favorite uh, programs that is requested or that is a staple in the curriculum is making flaxseed hair gel and so we use a scientific method to uh, 
build the steps to create their own hair care product that at that point they can take home and replicate again on their own. And it's fairly affordable, flaxseed and some water. <laughs> and so when they use the scientific method, it's been an opportunity to dig deeper into their academics and make that connection where before, in addition to their lower self-esteem sometimes, their lower academic performance was impacted as well. So I'm building bridges <laughs> all, all throughout the curriculum. So the flaxseed is a favorite, and I personally like when the girls learn how to um, do their own head wrap. <laughs> yes, <laughs> come to school <laughs> with the head wrap. So can you break down what STEAM is? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And it's pretty much an acronym that is used in education because it's too much to say <laughs> each one of them. But the students usually have a connection to them throughout the school day at, from their classes in mathematics or even in social studies, something like that. But STEAM overall is uh, an area where girls are um, underrepresented and typically that gap uh, widens from uh, sixth grade to seventh grade. So you have like all the girls are powerhouses in math and elementary and then all of a sudden, well, what do we notice mm -hmm. happens? Well, they start caring a little more about what how their appearance is in the school. Mm -hmm. don't, get, don't get it twisted, <laughs> they care at five, they care. <laughs> but by 11 and 12, they're in charge of their look a little right. bit more and, and more responsive to peer in, input. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm here. I know it's so easy, especially when you have hair that you feel like is untamable. <laughs> and I feel like it's so easy to reach for relaxers or the magic potion, the sure creamy crack, whatever they call it. It's so easy, but like you say you want people, which is fine if that's what you want to do, but you say you want people to embrace their natural curls. So for like maybe the girls or anybody out there that may be in that situation where they have relaxed right now and they're like, oh, well, I have bad hair now, like, is it too late for them? Well, to me, I, I stay away from even untamable. Some of these words have really negative connotations, right. and that's what's impacting their self-esteem. One of the things that I encourage is to have healthy hair. So my tagline, stay curly, well, that's an option. Um, <laughs> but what's more important is if you're having healthy hair, whether it's with natural hair care products or understanding the impact and the bonds that are breaking when you have a chemical relaxer, what it's actually doing to your hair, that empowers those girls and women and men to use the products appropriately and understand the impact that it could have. You might end up having to shave it off if you want to have your okay. curls back. Just know that, <laughs> you know, and to actually maintain it. That's the difference. A lot of times people are trying a little too much in the experimentation and without education. And in fact, you asked about programming. We do compare the products. So we look at different hair care products from that you can buy at the grocery store um, or a, a natural products store as well as uh, what you could make from natural ingredients and compare the result <laughs> or uh, compare uh, if it's got a certain alcohol in it, parabens, a lot of us are seeing that mm -hmm. alcohol free, paraben free, and what does that actually mean and what do those products do to your hair? So why is my hair curly? We explore that. Oh, I love it. I've seen too, like, even, you know, this is the academic level, but once they go into like the workforce, like to be able to embrace that. I uh, worked for an employer once that um, wrote somebody up basically because they had some sort of braid or, or corner roll, but you don't understand like how difficult it is to take care of hair. Like, have you ever experienced anything like that? One thing I found, everyone has hair or issues with it. So <laughs> with Girls on the Block, I've had young girls, and I know we're gonna get to the workplace, but we've had young girls uh, with straight hair, uh, Mexican girls with cousin with curly hair, white girls with curly <laughs> hair, black girls with permed hair. And so the conversation is, continues with the Crown Act actually in college. Colorado. And so we're able to share why uh, we wear protective hairstyles and what it does for our hair. So we may not have to wake up and do two hours worth of hair every single day. And um, in, in regard to encouraging employers to be more culturally uh, sensitive and aware of their impact in the workplace. It happened to me. I wore uh, two bantu knots in the back out. I was fly according to the <laughs> curly girl standards. <laughs> However, I was made fun of by um, a superior and called Mickey Mouse the entire day and laughed at. And, and that's a really low level, um, right. you know, teasing or harassment really. But other women are losing jobs um, or told if they don't change or cover their hair, 
you know, they they won't be able to show up to work and, and that impacts, you know, their household overall. But in Colorado, it's illegal now, so I love it. <laughs> you got to change that. Well, the work that you're doing is so important, yeah. so I really pre appreciate you for doing it, and thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Right. It was really great being able to look back on those mm -hmm. conversations. And if you want some new ones, don't worry. We'll be back next week on our free 9 News Plus app and 9news.com.